Good morning, brothers and sisters. And again, welcome to this week's studies. As we continue working through the book of Daniel, chapter 11, shall we thank our Heavenly Father for his guidance so far and for his continued watch care over us. Let us join together and be able to discuss and examine these verses that we need to address so that we may understand more at this time. Shall we now come before him in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we have great need of you in all ways and in all things. Help us now, Father. Direct us where you would have us to walk. May your will be done. There are so many things, Father, that we do not understand clearly. As we come before you, we come before you not as just our creator, not just as the author and finisher of our faith, but as our friend. Help us now as we open your word so that your will may be done and we may come to understand that which you would have us to know at this time. Thank you for those that are here for this meeting. Help us each one now to contribute so that we may more clearly understand what we need to know so that our minds might be knit together to be able to understand this message. It is for this reason, Father, that we come before you. We thank you in prayer. We praise you. We ask for these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, Smith's comment, before we get into verse 22, has a lot to do regarding this with Tiberius. That tyranny, hypocrisy, infamous debauchery, and beastly intemperance. If these traits are practices to show a man to be vile, Tiberius exhibited that character in disgusting perfection. Now, in verse 22, we have the comment being made, and with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him, and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. Now, is this saying that the prince of the covenant is going to be broken? Mm -hmm. Or is this? Okay. Yeah, that's actually exactly what the Hebrew says. Um, okay. So it's saying the city shall be destroyed, right? Because this, this is referring back to um, Daniel 9, right? Dealing with, uh, you know, he should confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week shall he cause sacrifice and oblation to cease for the overspreading of abominations. He shall make it desolate. Right. And it's going to be until the end, uh, the consummation desolations are determined or whatever it says. They're exactly the words. This is referring to that, to that event. So the cross and the destruction of Jerusalem. And um, so the flood here. So the question is, we we go from. Uh, you know, Julius Caesar to Augustus Caesar to Tiberius. Now, um, Augustus is important because he's going to be the one where Christ is going to be born. And then it's under Tiberius that Christ is going to be crucified. Right. Yeah. Now, it's not under Tiberius that the city is destroyed. Right. That's going to be. uh Later, under uh, whatever the guy's name is, I can't think of it at the moment. Uh, Vespasian, is it under Vespasian? Anyway, so, but, but, so some people would say, well, they're jumping ahead to the future. And, and in a sense, he is, because this is a repeat and enlarge. So he's, he's going to introduce these ideas and then he's going to go back over it again, right? So he's going to address the destruction of Jerusalem again later. Um, but part of the reason that it's here is that it's a Christ is being presented in contrast to Julius Caesar and to the emperors that follow. Right. So there's this contrast that's being shown uh, in the in these characters. And, and that's not generally seen in Daniel 11. Right. So just to remind people. So when we are in Daniel 11 and we started with. Um, this part where we had the death of Julius Caesar, that's going to be on verse, yeah, verse 19, so 1119. 
He shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but shall stumble and fall and not be found, right? And just before that in verse 18, it says he shall turn his face unto the isles, right? So you have this uh, Caesar turning his face unto the isles, his, um, and shall take away many. And then we say that a prince that is the prince of the covenant, which is what it's referring to here, is, is going to cause uh, the reproach to cease. He doesn't have his own reproach. He causes it to turn upon him. So we're taking that word turn, shuv, and we can see Julius Caesar's turns, but his turns are personal ambitions, especially in verse 19. He shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land. That's when he goes back to Rome and he's going to, you know, basically try to be set up as king, but he's going to die, right? He shall stumble and fall and not be found. And then, then in his estates can stand up this razor of taxes, a razor of taxes, Caesar Augustus. And then we have Tiberius. So those are introduced because we, we introduced Christ already. We contrasted him with Caesar. And so now we would come back to it again, uh, the destruction of Jerusalem and the crucifixion of Christ. Now, they have that, and then in verse 23, if we remember, it's going to introduce the Roman League. So it's going to go back, right? So we, we've got all this stuff brought up to the time of Christ, and then the Jewish Roman League is going to be introduced in verse 23, and uh, and that's going to be the reason for the destruction of Jerusalem, right? So they're going to address um, all of these events that, that tie that previous history to the destruction of Jerusalem. So, so this repeat and enlarged way in which Daniel 11 is done makes much more sense than all of the other interpretations that I've seen. And Uriah Smith, of course, has part of that, but there are pieces of the puzzle he's missing. But he doesn't have quite the whole picture. Yeah, he does. He doesn't have the whole picture, right? Now, you know, in some ways it's understandable, but they did reject the foundation of the first and second angel's messages. So, you know, in a, in a way that, I mean, they're going backwards in biblical interpretation at this point, you know, in the 1870s when Uriah Smith writes these articles, late, late, you know, well, this is in 1871. So, <clears throat> so yeah, we can now see that that this makes a lot of sense. Now, uh, Uriah Smith is going to try to use Bishop Newton's reading, the arms of the overflower shall be overflown from before him, and shall be broken. And, and that makes no sense. It doesn't say that in Hebrew. So Bishop Newton's translation does not agree better with the original. The arms of a flood with the arms of a flood is how it should be translated. It shall be overflown from before him. Okay. Now, it's interesting that this reference regarding the Prince of the Covenant, when we look at what the translators had seen, they gave footnotes back to Daniel 8, verses 10 and 11, and then 8.25. And the one that, of course, I, I would say is very pointed for our current study would be 825, which would read, and though and through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. This cross-reference would, of course, preclude anything having to do with Antiochus Epiphanes. It would also preclude anything having to do with Islam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now, in Daniel 11, verse 22, in the King James, I would make yeah. only one sort of emendation to the text. Okay. That is... 
so it says the arms of the flood are overflowed from before him. Yeah, this is Young's literal translation. And are broken. And they have also the Prince of the Covenant. But when we look at the words here, uh, broken, uh, shabar, to break in pieces. You know, it's it's in what they call the nifal, imperfect third person, masculine, plural, right? And in the uh, form here, just hang on, because it because uh, it can say, and he shall be broken, right? Because the personal pronoun is attached to. So when it says, uh, "The arms of the flood shall be overflown from before him." And he shall be broken is how you could translate it. And then uh, this this word, well, it's translated as yea also. I mean, that means that's basically a good translation. We could say more specifically, right, instead of yea also, we could, I would usually translate more specifically the prince of the covenant. He's the one that's going to be broken. Now, so the arms of the flood, uh, shall they be overflown from before him? That is, that's referring to the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, the question is the hymn here. So, so the hymn is, it's really difficult with these personal pronouns, right? So we know that they shall be overflown. Um, and then we have from before his face. And, and I believe that that's the face of God. Right. That's how we okay. understood. So that's before, you know, before God's face. That is, God's people are going to be destroyed. The city of Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. So it's not saying the city of Jerusalem is going to be broken. Right. It's going to be overflown. Does that, that make sense? So and, and we had looked at this before. So it says with the arms of a flood shall they, that is the Jewish nation, be overflown in the destruction of Jerusalem from before him, before God's face. And what I would add, and he shall be broken, right? So I would add that to the King James. I would put the word he there because that's uh, implied. It's not they shall be broken. Um, let me see again if I'm doing that right. Okay, actually, it is they. So, so it's they shall be broken. So maybe I should, um, yeah. So masculine plural. Of course, you could plot apply that to God, even though it's plural. You could. Do that. I'm just looking here at this. Oh, okay. So even um, from before His face is also plural. That's interesting. Okay, I'm just looking at all the, the forms here. So we got, um, so when it says the arms of the flood, that's going to be in the feminine plural, or the arms, the arms is in the feminine plural. The flood is in the masculine singular. It's a noun, right? Then you have, um, next word is to overflow, and that's, uh, uh, the nifal imperfect third person masculine plural. So that means it, it to be overflown, right? So it's imperfect just means it's, it's talking about something that hasn't happened yet. And, but it's masculine plural. So they shall be overflown. And then, then, uh, it's also, uh, the preposition there we have in front, in front of, his face so that's going to be plural so they they could have said from uh before their face referring to god because god's often referred to in the plural and then it's going to have uh, and he shall be broken or they shall be broken right because it's got the the vav with a dot in it at the end so that refers to the plural rather than the yod at the end. And then and then it has this word, uh, well, it has a vav, just that's a conjunction, and then it says gam, which is 
that is, and then it's going to have the masculine sing singular, the prince, and then it's going to have the feminine singular of the covenant. So covenants are going to be feminine. It's a noun. So nouns are masculine or feminine. They don't necessarily have to agree with what's being said. They just have their form. Uh, berit, the T at the end makes it feminine. Right. So, so the prince of the covenant. So if we were going to translate this, the way that I would translate it anyway is that the arms of the flood are overflowed from before his face and he is broken. That is specifically the prince of the covenant. So I don't know what you think of that, whether that makes sense. Well, for other reasons, I've not been one to like or agree with the repeated inclusions that Smith uses of Bishop Newton. Well, well, I like Bishop Newton. It's just that what he does is he uses Bishop Newton. It's, it's kind of a lazy way of giving authority, right? Correct. So instead of actually addressing the verse itself, right, and looking at what it says and trying to show that it should be translated that way, he just said he, he throws a name there. And and then that, you know, people just accept it, right? Because, well, it's Bishop Newton, right? So, you know, I'm just going to accept accept that uh, translation. Um, and he does this in a lot of places. I mean, when he has a weak argument, he just he just name drops and and that sort of settles the issue. And, and that's the thing I don't like. Nothing wrong with Bishop Newton. It's just it's how how Uriah Smith uses him. All right. Because Bishop Newton, his his understanding of prophecy aligns pretty much with Adventism. You know, uh, you know, obviously he's before the Protestants become part of Babylon. Right. It's around a long time ago, in the 1700s. So, yeah, you know, that that's the problem. So I, I, I don't see any reason, though, he has the arms of the overflower shall be overflown from before him and shall be broken. But he doesn't really he doesn't really explain why that reading's better. Right. So as we've been addressing this part of it, of course, here's Smith quotes. Bishop Newton presents the following reading as agreeing better with the original. And you have made a prima facie case as to how this is not better. The expression signify revolution and violence. And in fulfillment, we should look for the arms of Tiberius, the overflower, to be overflown. Or in other words, for him to suffer a violent death. To show how this would be was accomplished, we are again, have recourse to the Encyclopedia Americana article on Tiberius. Acting the hypocrite to the last, he disguised his increasing debility as much as he was able, even affecting to join in the spots and exercises of the soldier, soldiers of his guard. At length, leaving his favorite island, the scene of the most disgusting debaucheries, he stopped at a country house near the promontory of Mycenae, where on the 16th of March of 37, he sunk into a lethargy in which he appeared dead, and Caligula was preparing with numerous escort to take possession of the empire, when his sudden revival threw them into consternation. At this critical instant, Macro, the praetorian prefect, caused him to be suffocated with pillows. Thus expired the emperor Tiberius in the 78th year of his age, and the 23rd year of his reign, universally execrated. Now, we apply this, of course, with Daniel 11.20. So, in noting here that this is all dealing with Tiberius, a case can be made that this has been fulfilled already in history. How would this be fulfilled in the present day? What, what, what in verse 20? How are we applying verse 20? I'm, to the no, I'm, I'm looking at verse 20 and 22. Okay, well, well we apply um, Tiberius to Trump. 
So are we saying that Trump, when he again assumes the presidency, as as we are looking for, that he is not going to remain in office that long that he would be assassinated? Well, no, because assassination, well, neither in anger nor in battle, right? So I don't think that would apply. I, I don't know. I mean, to be honest, I don't know how we would apply that specifically, whether we look at that as uh, what happened already with Trump, because it's not so much, you know, you don't parallel it that, you know, Trump has to die. It's not how we're lining up a parallel because it's a symbol, right? The symbol of what happened, we would have to apply, not, not, not literally to Trump as a person, if that makes sense. I'm, I'm just looking because, see, Daniel 1120 has been applied in the past with Obama because we have this then shall stand up in his place or in his estate a raiser of taxes and the glory of the kingdom. Right. So that was that was Obama. Yeah. Caesar Augustus is lined up with Obama. OK. But within a few days, he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. Oh, oh OK. So. Uh, OK. So that's the one. So the vile person. OK. So I was getting mixed up here. Because, see, I'm I'm looking at this. Yeah. OK. So that's Obama. Whereas and then Tiberius is mentioned. Um, where? Oh, that's where a vile person. OK. OK. Now, did you see that comment from the chat? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't we, I, I, I wouldn't uh, take it as meaning anything. It doesn't mean anything to me because they're not connected. OK. I'd have to have a line that connects those two. And I don't. That is the destruction of Jerusalem and the death of Tiberius. There's nothing that connects them. Okay. That's that's the way I would look at it. So 80 times 70, 560 years just doesn't mean anything to me. That is interesting, though, that it would be to the date. To the date? That's what's being presented right now in the chat, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't see the date there. It doesn't connect it to the date. Okay, so 16th of March 37 is what Smith is presenting. Yeah, that's nothing to do with the destruction of Jerusalem dates. Oh, oh Jehoiachin's capture. Okay, I, I was thinking of destruction of Jerusalem. Oh, 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 okay. Yeah, well, yeah, okay. If you try to connect Jehoiachin's capture, okay, what you're going to have with Jehoiachin is you're going to have him connected to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD by 666 years, right? But that there's 560 here, you got another 106 years to go, right? Does that make sense? So what's what's the date we got here? 16th of March of 37. 37 AD. AD? So we're just shy of 33 years before the second destruction of Jerusalem, but 560 years from this of Jehoiachin. Okay, but so that's 30, so it's not 560 then, because that's 37 AD, right? Correct. Yeah, so that's going to be 622 years. Now that makes more sense then. Okay. That's what I got. Just trying to see if this makes sense. Yeah, so if if you're going to deal with Jehoiachin's captivity, because there's 666 years from Jehoiachin's captivity to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, what you have, like 34 AD, you have 36 years to the destruction of Jerusalem, right? So there's the 36 years that um, that Jehoiachin is captive, right, from when he's taken captive to release. It's going to be like... 36 years and uh, 20, 23 days that he's held captive. Depends how you count the, you know, I'm counting biblical years. So, yeah, so I'm not sure how Angela got 560. Should do, well, how did she do that? 
Oh, my brain wasn't working well. <laughs> I was yeah. thinking 37 BC and 37 AD. Yeah. So anyway, the 622, there's, there's, uh, you know, 622, and then you have uh, 34 more years. I'm just trying to see if that, so if that ends up being an inclusive count. So how are we doing that? Okay, I'm doing that wrong. Pardon me. So, so 597 BC plus 36. 633 years is what it is. So 622 from the destruction of Jerusalem, 633 from the captivity of Jehoiachin. Yeah, I mean, it's going to mark, you know, because Jehoiachin's released in the 37th year of his captivity, and you got the 37th year AD, right? So, I mean, there is a, a loose connection there, but I don't think it's a primary connection at all. You know, how we connect, how do we connect that with Tiberius's death? What does that have to do with Jehoiachin's capture? I mean, it could be a connection of Babylon and Rome sort of in a mirror way or something like that, like a retribution. I don't know. I just, I wouldn't really connect them. I mean, we do have a date, but dates sometimes just line up and don't have any part of the structure. I mean, there's only 365 days in a year. So, you know, every once in a while, you're going to have something line up that as another date in scripture, but I don't know if I can connect those two events. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so when we go back to this, uh, the question that you were asking about was, well, we're, we're looking at this because Daniel 1120 was referred to again by both Smith and Newton. Mm -hmm. and well, when they're when they're giving this reference, but within a few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor, nor in battle. Which is Augustus. Okay. But is it also not applying here with Tiberius? Yeah, okay. So that's what was confusing me. So no. Um so we know Tiberius is is Trump, right? So we, we can't we can't take uh, Obama and connect it and see with Obama, he's not going to be like assassinated. Yeah. So that was what was confusing me. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't apply it to, to Trump. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Thanks for confusing me. Well, <laughs> I'm tired. So it's easy to confuse me right now. Smith continues. The Prince of the covenant unquestionably refers to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Prince, who was to confirm the covenant one week with his people. Daniel 9, 25 to 27. The prophet, having taken us down to the death of Tiberius, now mentions incidentally an event to transpire in his reign so important that it should not be passed over, namely the cutting off of the prince of the covenant, or in other words, the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did this event take place in the reign of Tiberius? It did. Luke mm -hmm. informs us, chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, that in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, John the Baptist commenced his ministry. The reign of Tiberius is reckoned, according to Prido, Dr. Hales, Lardner, and others, from his elevation to the throne to reign jointly with Augustus, his father-in-law, in August A.D. 12. His 15th year then would have been from August A.D. 26 to August A.D. 27. Christ was six months younger than John and is supposed to have commenced his ministry six months later. Both according to the law of the priesthood entering into their work when they were 30 years of age. If John commenced in the spring, in the latter portion of Tiberius' 15th year, it would bring the commencement of Christ's ministry to the autumn of A.D. 27. And here the best of authorities place the baptism of Christ, it being the exact point where the 483 years from B.C. 457 were to extend to Messiah the Prince, terminated, and Christ went forth proclaiming that the time was fulfilled. From this point we go forward three years and a half, to find the date of the crucifixion, 
for Christ attended but four Passovers and was crucified at the last. Three and a half years from the autumn of AD 27 brings us to the spring of AD 31. The death of Tiberius is placed but six years later in AD 37. Okay, so Uriah Smith is extremely sloppy here. And so the 15th year of Tiberius, he doesn't address, I mean, he puts it there, and, and that's based on Prideau? Right. Okay, which, which um, yeah, I'm not sure that that's real. Well, it's definitely not correct. So, so it, and how Prideau is doing it, because the 15th year of Tiberius, if we take how the Romans counted it, would be from, uh, you know, the autumn of 28 to the autumn of 29 A.D., Right. So, so the fifteenth year of Tiberius is. So let me see. Uh, can you f- go back there? Because I have to look at his calculations. What he does here. Sure. Okay. So Prado, Dr. Hales, Lardner, and others from his elevation to the throne reign during the Augustus, August AD twelve. His fifteenth year would then be August AD twenty six. August. August 80, 27. And that's not correct. It'd be 28 to 29. If we are to take now, now, so he is, he is kind of addressing it, but he's addressing the joint reign, but he doesn't explain the problem that, that that's not really Tiberius's 15th year. So the question is, how do we do that? How do we get Tiberius 15, 15th year? to be AD 26 to AD 27, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Now, now he's going to go August AD 27, um, and the commencement of Christ's ministry in the autumn of AD 27, wouldn't that be the 16th year of Tiberius? <laughs> in the way that... Okay, that would be, but he's saying that John's going to start his ministry in the year of Tiberius. He starts right. his buzzing there. Okay. Yeah, he's just leaving out a lot. I mean, this is this is one of those areas that's uh, there, there's so many different opinions on. So he he's just presenting his argument. He's not presenting any other argument. He's not actually explaining what he's doing here. He's just and and the reason why I don't like this is Adventists do this all the time. They address something where they just say, "Well, here is how it is." And then you look it up and nobody agrees with it, right? That is, you can't find any supporting argument for what they've just done. Um, so he, he, he makes a bit of an attempt. You know, he, he uses other people. Um, that he says that they're going to reckon the reign of Tiberius, you know, Prideaux, Hales, Lardner, and others, from when he uh, comes to the throne. But the Romans don't do it that way, Right. They're not counting his 15th year from August 80, 27 to August, uh, or 80, 26 to August 80, 27. So when you look at, if you go on Wikipedia and you look at the reign of Tiberius, and based upon the documents that the Romans used, um, the reign of Tiberius, his 15th year is not going to be that. So, so we need to understand this. We need to understand that that Luke is going to count the reign of Tiberius. One is he's not going to use the Roman calendar. He's going to use the Macedonian calendar, which is a lunar calendar. It's the one that the common people use. And he's going to use um, what they call uh, non-accession year dating, accession year dating. And he's going to, uh, so he's not going to count it from the time of the joint reign as as Uriah Smith tries to do it here. He's just going to be using a different calendar and counting differently. So does that make sense? It's not going to be August to August. It's it's not going to be August to August at all. So, 
right? So anyway, this is wrong. That's all I'm trying to say. It's not how we would do it. This is, as you are as you are showing, some very sloppy scholarship. Yeah, and and it's something that bothers me about Adventists in general because it's it's always been a hindrance for me personally to recognize that Adventists just ignore uh, reality that makes us no different than Jehovah's Witnesses or other groups that will, they will present their argument because they've already started with a conclusion and they, they will just take anything that fits to make their date work. And uh, they ignore all of the arguments pretty much. And just, and, and so then when Adventists like me who start to look into details realize, well, you can't support it with this type of argument, that there's no no support for it at all, then it, it puts questions and doubts upon Adventism, right? Especially when you see things like 457, where we just have, you know, we're going to have Artaxerxes giving his decree in the fall of 457. You know, he's, he's going to give his decree then? Well, if he does that in the fall of 457, and that's his seventh year, then, you know, the 2300 days doesn't work, right? They just, they don't consider the journey, you know, from the first day of the first month in his seventh year to the first day of the fifth month, etc. So, so this message, the detail that we have addressed chronology, and this is one thing that I need to write out, because um, I don't have it all in my mind completely sorted out. But we need to address this point of how we're counting the 15th year of Tiberius. Because different people provide different solutions depending on when they want to have Christ crucified. This argument that he presents here is actually more for people who want Christ crucified in uh, 30 AD, not 31 AD. So, but, so he's kind of mixing things and he's he's not being completely honest because I don't think they all use August uh, all these three people I don't think they use August as the date so so he's not quite presenting their views correctly so he, he's just presenting it as if this, this is a fact that we can just do this and and uh, yeah, I, I just don't like sloppiness when it comes to these types of details well, in this in this situation, well, he is trying to say that this joint reign began in August of AD 12. He's not addressing renal year. He's not addressing many things. He's just yeah. placing a conclusion <clears throat> and leaving it for the reader to make up their mind, you know, whether they're going to agree with him or disagree. Yeah, so Prideaux, Hales, and Lardner, they might say that there was a joint reign in AD 12 in August, but I don't think they actually count the years of his reign in that way, right? That is, they're not going to say the 15th year of Augustus is AD 26 to AD 27, August to August, right? So he's, he's not being, he's not being clear. I mean, I would say he's not being honest. Right. Um, in how he's presenting what they have presented. And and those types of things really bother me. Just because, you know, when I present stuff, I'm going to be completely honest what the problems are and how I address them. Right. So I'm not going to just give something as a final conclusion. I'll show, you know, people have different views. Here's why they have this different view. And, you know, but, but yeah, it's anyway, so I don't like it. I don't like this, 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 uh, this passage here of Uriah Smith, this paragraph. This is one of those situations where when a student is asked to support their conclusion and show their work, Smith has come to the right conclusion, but the premise and the work that he has done is 
less than acceptable. Yeah, and, and well, and I don't think, well, his conclusion that Jesus' ministry begins in the autumn of 27 AD, that is, Christ is baptized in the fall of 27 AD. His ministry actually begins in the spring, you know, depending how you look at the start of his ministry, right? Okay. Right. We, we, you agree with me, it's going to be in the spring that he's actually going to begin his ministry. He went <clears throat> through this period where the the ministry would begin in the fall, but there was a preparation for his public, the, the public portion of his ministry that did not immediately begin and began then later in the spring. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, because first he's going to be baptized and then he's going to be, you know, 40 days in the wilderness then tempted of the devil right at the end of the 40 days. And, and you know, he's going to, of course, begin gathering disciples and so forth. But it's really not till the, till the spring that he begins his public, public ministry. But, you know, I mean, we can often say, yeah, he starts his ministry. But I would just be more that, you know, Christ is baptized in the fall of 27 AD. Now, and then here says, um, and here is the best, <coughs> here are the best of authorities. Well, I mean, you know, how do you decide what the best of authorities are? The ones that agree with you? That seems to be Smith's way, yes. Yeah, right. So, you know, and to me, are they authorities, right? <laughs> you know, the Bible is an authority. These aren't authorities. These are people with opinions. You know, so you can say, well, the best authorities are the people who agree with me, or there's people that have opinions that agree with mine. So mine must be correct. Well, you're going to find lots of authorities that don't agree. Right. So if we start using authorities, then then we've weakened the word of God as an authority. Right? I think this unsmith's part, is a publicly offered dig at the manner in which Father Miller had presented this period. Well, yeah, I just, I don't know if he's, I mean, he's trying to make a dig at Miller, but, you know, there's there's a bunch of stuff that happens because even when you look at Samuel Snow and how he looks at these dates, he gets it all wrong. Right. He doesn't have um, it starting with Christ's baptism in the fall of 27 AD, you know, in his, uh, you know, the true midnight cry. He, he gets some of this stuff wrong. And, you know, in some ways you can excuse people because they don't have the resources we have today. So Uriah Smith is kind of just picking and choosing from authorities the ones that agree with him, he calls the best, but it's actually not accurate, right? So we would need to understand this more uh, carefully. We have to go through this. So one day I will get this done where I address this. In my week of Christ study, I want to address uh, that. So, So anyway, I don't consider these people authorities, like in the sense that we can just accept what, someone says if they agree with us we need to we need to be able to show it from the evidence right so if he said you know well the evidence places the baptism of christ in the fall of 27 a.d well that's a lot different than saying the authorities place the baptism of christ in 27 a.d in the autumn right right now now some people I run into people actually who don't like the fact that I use evidence. Like there are some people who just think we should accept um, what Ellen White says or what Miller says without any critical thought, right? Which to me is kind of intellectual suicide because it's a circular type of reasoning. You're a Seventh-day Adventist, so you just accept what Seventh-day Adventists say. In a sense, you know, I mean, we do have to have things based upon reality. The reason why I believe in Adventism is because it's based upon reality. If I start to undermine the reality part of it, and then I just start accepting things that I think are correct because they fit in with my worldview, at some point I might find that many of those things are not correct, 
and then my faith will falter. And and so this is kind of um, something that I was wrestling with while I was in Australia, because, you know, the question is, what is it that we, why is it, you know, because we have chronology here. And I say we need something objective that's outside of our own subjective experience that our faith must be based upon. Now, some people argue, well, I have a relationship with Christ. And that relationship with Christ is real. And so I don't need to know anything about this chronology stuff. I can just follow my relationship. God can speak to me personally. Now, of course, I grew up with my dad, who believed that God was speaking to him all the time. And God definitely wasn't the one speaking to him, right? Because it didn't agree with God's word. So, so God's word is the authority. Um, but God does want us to have his word based upon reality. That is, because God's word is an authority, it should base, it should agree with reality. Now, sometimes, you know, I don't know reality enough to compare it. But in the area of chronology here, we have something that is objective that we can compare. And we also have the symbolic use of numbers. So to me, for my experience, I'm not going to just trust my personal feelings. I'm not going to just say, well, like a Mormon would, well, the burning in my bosom makes me believe something to be true. Because we know when we go through the time of trouble that our senses are going to be captivated by Satan. Things will not appear as they really are. So it'll appear, for instance, that we are the outcast of the earth, just like when Satan comes to Christ and says, if thou be the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Ellen White says that it appeared to Christ that what Satan was implying is that, well, you're probably the fallen angel. You have to prove to me that you're that you're actually the Christ. And from Christ's own view of himself, what Satan was um, implicating seemed to be true because he didn't feel like the son of God, right? So, but he knew that his father 40 days before had said, thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, right? So, so he had the word of God to depend upon, which was not, you know, something subjective, his own feelings. So there's, there's power in the word of God. So, so that's the problem that I have here with the, this sort of sloppiness is it's dangerous to Seventh-day Adventists who are then going to have their ministers come and say, well, you know, Christ couldn't have been baptized in 27 AD because whatever reason they give, um, you know, they could say, look on Wikipedia, when's the 15th year of Tiberius, right? Um, and they can go through all these different arguments and just say, you know, Adventism, you know, it was a nice idea, this 2300 days and the 70 weeks. But, you know, it was just an interpretation that we had. It wasn't based on reality. Well, why would you be a Seventh-day Adventist then? Why are you going to stand for the Sabbath and so forth? That That's my my view, is that our personal experience isn't enough. It has to be based on reality. And it has to be based upon God's word, which is based on reality. You know, it has okay. to be based on something that's solid, not something that's like this, uh, the changing, shifting sands of, of emotions and human opinions. No, you can't uh, submit corrections to Wikipedia, Kelly. Kelly's asking if I submitted corrections to Wikipedia. Actually, they do. They are asking for corrections in a lot of situations. Yeah, but they may be asking for it, but there's still gatekeepers there who aren't going to allow it. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I've looked into it. There are areas in which you you can. You can add, like, uh, references. They often want references to things. But But there's people there that are in control. So you, you can't just... And there's be no point. It's not. It's not going to get accepted. Okay. We can get is not our authority. We, we can get go there for information, but we always have to recognize that it's still just as much a man's opinion as anything else. 
So you have to go back to the original documentation and the things that can be proven. Now, the next verse. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall be strong with a small people. Two points in in this, the word made is an added word. Second, in this same in the same vein, that he shall work deceitfully, the translators use as another reference to Daniel 8.25. Now, I found it interesting that the translators in the margin would place this as being fulfilled in 171 BC during the Third Macedonian War. 171? Yep. Because they're dealing with, what, Atticus Epiphanes or something? I would say that they're trying to deal with the Antiochus Epiphanes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we understand that this now is going back and explaining why Jerusalem is destroyed. Okay. Right. That's how we understood it when we went through this, right? Because we come up to the destruction of Jerusalem and, of course, the crucifixion of Christ. And so now the reason for that is this Roman Jewish League. Right. So we, we know that we have those two dates, 161 and 158, that are tied together. Right. Okay. So here, Smith continues. The him with whom the league here spoke and is made must be the same power which has been the subject of the prophecy from the 14th verse. And that is the Roman power is shown beyond controversy in the fulfillment of the prophecy in three individuals, as already noticed, who successfully stood at the head of the Roman Empire, Julius Augustus and Tiberius Caesar. The first one returning to the fort of his own land in triumph, stumbled and fell, and was not found. Verse 19. The second was a raiser of taxes, and he reigned in the glory of the kingdom, and died neither in anger nor in battle, but peacefully in his own bed. Verse 20. The third was a dissembler and one of the vilest characters. He entered into the kingdom peacefully, but ended both his reign and his life in violence. And in, in his reign, the prince of the covenant, Jesus of Nazareth, was put to death on the cross. Verses 21 and 22. Christ can never be broken or put to death again. <clears throat> Hence, in no other government, at no other time, can we find a fulfillment of these events. Some attempt to apply these verses to Antiochus and make one of the Jewish high priests the prince of the covenant, though they are never called such. This is the same kind of reasoning which endeavors to make the reign of Antiochus a fulfillment of the little horn of Daniel 8. And it is offered for the same purpose, namely to break the great chain of evidence by which it is shown that the Advent doctrine is the doctrine of the Bible and that Christ is now at the door. But the chain cannot be broken nor the evidence overthrown. Here, Smith is making a very good point as to how we cannot have Antiochus IV Epiphanes involved in this situation any comment well yeah he's correct there so it's definitely not antiochus epiphanes having taken us down through the secular events of the empire to the end of the 70 weeks the prophet in verse 23 takes us back to the time when the romans became directly connected with the people of god by the jewish league bc 161 from which point we are then taken down in a direct line of events to the final triumph of the church and the setting up of God's everlasting kingdom. The Jews, being grievously oppressed by the Syrian kings, sent an embassy to Rome to solicit the aid of the Romans and to join themselves in a league of amity and, or amity and confederacy with them. First Maccabean 8. Prido, 2nd, page 166, Josephus, Antiquities B, 12th chapter, 
10th section, 6. The Romans listened to the request of the Jews and granted them a decree couched in these words. The decree of the Senate concerning a league of assistance and friendship with the nation of the Jews. It shall not be lawful for any that are subject to the Romans to make war with the nation of the Jews, nor to assist those that do so, either by sending them corn or ships or money. And if any attack be made upon the Jews, the Romans shall assist them as far as they are able. And again, if any attack be made upon the Romans, the Jews shall assist them. And if the Jews have a mind to add to or take from this league of assistance, that shall be done with the common consent of the Romans. And whatever addition shall thus be made, it shall be of force. This decree, says Josephus, was written by Apollonius, the son of John, and by Jason, the son of Eleazar, when Judas was the high priest of the nation, and Simon, his brother, was general of the army. And this was the first league that the Romans made with the Jews, and was managed after this manner. At this time, the Romans were a small people and began to work deceitfully or with cunning, as the word signifies. And from this point, they rose a steady and rapid ascent to the bite of power, which they afterwards the attained. The height of power. Yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm understanding that point, Kelly, but I don't think that's... Corn is just wheat. Okay. So it's interesting, as we had addressed historically before, that with Caesar, that we have those like Herod that came to, or Herod's father, that came to Caesar's aid so very quickly against Egypt. So the Jews were very focused that, you know, hey, we're we're this this wonderful people. We've made a league with this other wonderful people, even though according to the to the very instructions given by God to Moses, they were not to enter into a league with any around them. Yeah. Now now we know of course the from uh, the first league made with the Gibeonites to 158 to 666, no, 1335 years. And 666 times two years to 161, right? And then we have from 13, from the end of that 1335, 666 inclusive years to the beginning of the 1335 of Daniel 11, or Daniel 12, pardon me, verse, is that verse 12? Anyway, um, so, so we know that this Roman Jewish League he gives 161. We know that that dates when they make the league, but it goes into effect when they actually utilize it, which is in 158. Right. Right. That, that's the way that we understand it. Now, so in Young's literal translation, after they join themselves unto him, he, he worketh deceit and hath increased and hath been strong by a few of the nation. Now, that's the way he translates it. And what he's doing here is, um, so literally what you have in Hebrew is, so after they unite, what it says, so after they make this league, um, and I think this preposition here it doesn't make sense to me. Well, that's just with. Okay. So after they make a league with, him now technically it looks like them not him but uh anyway uh he shall do deceitfully right treacherously and then it says and ascend and then it's going to say and be numerous uh with a small People or goy, which is going to be goy, not goyim. It's not going to be plural. It's just going to be singular. 
Yeah. So the small, small people. So, so the question is, is the small people referring to the Romans or is the small people referring to the Jews? Um, and this word strong that's, that's translated strong is actually numerous. So how would we take that? How could it be the Jews? Well, they could be a small people. That's, that's all I'm saying is that's one option that the Romans are going to dominate them. That's, that's one way that, because the Romans are going to be numerous. It, are the Romans a small people at this time? No, they're not. That's the problem. Okay. So then, so who is the small people? Is it just some of the Romans go into Judea? And that's what just means like a few people. They're going to become numerous with a few people. You know, as, as we're looking at this, I, I have to admit, I've not really considered that as far as the small people before. Well, we did talk about it before. Okay. So we had, and after the leak, so we have that. We parallel 161 BC and 158 to November 9th, 1989 to December 25th, 91. He, the papacy, shall work deceitfully, use the League for Furthering Roman Interests in the Eastern Regions. And then what we have is for he, Pompey, shall come up, right? That is, he's going to enter Judea 64 and 63 BC and shall become numerous with a small people or nation. We don't, we didn't really, we discussed it, but we didn't really settle on is that, that they just, come with a small amount how do they become numerous with a small okay people? now that pompey came yeah. in with an army is correct yeah we noted as we were going through this before that history shows that caesar came in with a very small force so after the defeat of pompey in caesar's civil war after the defeat of the armies of the Roman Republic, Caesar was left with a situation. He was to enforce the will of Ptolemy that his children, under the protection and guardianship of Rome, should rule Egypt. But was the army that Caesar had with him at that time a great people? No. So you're going to try to put Caesar in here after 63. So you got Pompey comes in 63. And Correct. Then, so and then he shall become numerous with a small people as referring to a period of time later. Well, that's an application, and that's that's a presentation that can also have a relationship with what we're looking at for present truth. Okay, well, what we had with present truth is we had the Jewish League that's going to be uh, marked with what happens in that 777 days with the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, that is the papacy in the United States are going to work, work together, right, to do that. But the papacy is the one that's going to work deceitfully furthering the interests of paper Rome with the USA. Now, then we had for he Pompey shall come up. Well, we didn't actually parallel him with anything. We just put Pompey right. in equal. So, so we didn't know uh, what we would do with that. Now, um, now we had him coming up, um, entering Judeo Syria 64 63 BC and we put that equals 911 right so you know that's that's what we did right and then we're going to say uh, and he shall become strong that's numerous with a small people nation and so we took small people as uh the Hebrew numbers there. So what do we have? We have um, 4592 plus, 
and we have uh, 6,063. So we add small, which is 4592, with people, 1471. We get 6063. And <coughs> that counts from 9-11 to the first day of the first month in 2018. So we had a connection there with 2018. So I'm not sure exactly how we would look at this. In the present truth, I think it has something to do with Parminder. That is, you know, but we didn't really apply that, you know, uh, exactly. So I, I think it has to do with Parminder's movement. So, so Pompey, in our history, uh, so I look at Parminder as an incursion of the papacy within our movement, but I'm not sure how we would address that. Okay. Um, so we just don't have what Pompey represents. So we're, we're probably going to have to dig into this a little bit more tomorrow, but, you know, because it's something we didn't finish in our present truth application. But as far as historically, that's Pompey coming in, Judea, Syria, that's that Syria, and that's going to be the siege of Jerusalem in 63 BC. But when it says, and then, now it says he shall come up, right? So we're, we're giving that as an individual, and shall become strong. But, you know, we know that this is referring to to Rome itself, not to particular individuals. So we put Pompey there. Pompey comes up um, and has this siege, which we marked as 9-11. But I think we could also put that as 11-9 in, in an application dealing with Parminder, because that is a siege of this movement. So... But we, we can discuss that more tomorrow. I don't know if you want to. Like, well, this 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 document's uh, almost over, right? Right. Okay. Strong numerous. Okay. So you're right. We are coming close to the close of our time together today. Do we have any other comments or questions that we need to address? Um, stay on. Yeah. Well, I'm just dealing with some of this number stuff. Stay on a second. I'll just finish this and then, yeah, I don't know. I'm going to have to look at this over if I have a chance today before the study tomorrow. Okay. Any other comment? Then shall we close with prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we have spent together. We thank you for the opportunity we have to examine what you are presenting so that we may be guided and our minds opened so that we may truly understand. Be with us today in all that you would have us to do. Help us now as we go through this day that we may look to honor and glorify your name in all ways and in all things. For this we ask, for this we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.